This is the first of a, of a new session of introductory course lectures. They run for six months, one a month, and uh, this first lecture tonight will be on uh, a principle of Buddhism called the Ten Worlds, and then next month uh, we shall have a lecture on Nam Myoho Renge Kyo, which is the fundamental practice, as you, most of you may know, chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. And the third lecture is on the Gohonzon, which is the scroll or object of devotion. And the fourth lecture is on what we call the human revolution, that is say the change that we can achieve in our own lives through the practice, uh, which is also fundamental to the movement for world peace, which is part of our aims. And the fourth lecture is the daily practice of Gongyo, called Gongyo, and the final, that's, sorry, that's the fifth lecture, and the final lecture is a short history of how all this came so about. We'll dive in straight away uh, and talk this evening about uh, the principle known as the Ten Worlds, which is actually part of another principle, uh, which is called, in Japanese, Ichinen Sanzen. Oh, Ichinen Sanzen means 3,000 worlds or states of life in a moment of existence. 3,000 worlds or states of life in a single moment of existence. And we'll be talking about that a bit this evening as well. So the ten worlds, starting at the worst, are hell, hunger, animality, anger, tranquility, rapture, learning, absorption, bodhisattva, and Buddhahood. Now, in early Buddhism, that is to say, the teachings of Shakyamuni Buddha, or Gautama Buddha, before he taught the Lotus Sutra, which was eight years before he died, those earlier teachings uh, taught the ten worlds, but not as an entity in themselves. That is to say, each world was taught separately. And people were in a sense categorized uh, according to whatever world they might be in, in this particular lifetime. And they were encouraged to improve their life condition and the causes that they were making in order to climb out of that world into a better world. And that was reckoned to take uh, probably eons of lifetimes in order to achieve, in some cases. So, depending on a per person's karma, however unfortunate it was, the slower they would be in moving from one world into the next. So, in a way, in that early Buddhism, the ten worlds were rather like a ladder of progress. You, pro you progressed, in other words, out of hell, which was the worst, through the other worlds, and especially into learning, absorption, and bodhisattva, and ultimately, after eons and eons of lifetimes, you might be fortunate, fortunate enough to be able to sustain the Buddha state as the main tendency of your life. Now that was the teachings before the Lotus Sutra. As you may or may not know, Shakyamuni Buddha taught for more than 40 years, a very long time. And as I say, eight years before he died, he taught the Lotus Sutra, or as it's sometimes known the, known, the Sutra of the Wonderful Law of the Lotus, which at that time he said was his supreme teaching. And furthermore, he said that all previous teachings should be discarded because the Lotus Sutra contained everything. So what did the Lotus Sutra say, which his previous teachings hadn't said? They said, first of all, and to everyone's absolute amazement at the time, that everyone had Buddhahood in them. That it was potentially there all the time. Previously, people had virtually looked upon Buddhahood as almost unattainable. Shakyamuni Buddha himself was extremely 
handsome, he was a prince, uh, he had wonderful qualities, great eloquence, and in those very early times, 3,000 years ago, in a feudal system, uh, all the people basically being peasants or serfs, no ordinary person could have possibly imagined that they could be and have the same qualities as, as the Buddha himself. Even if Shakyamuni had said that at that time, it simply wouldn't have penetrated people's intellects. But in the Lotus Sutra, Shakyamuni did say that. He clearly stated that Buddha was in everybody and everybody could attain Buddhahood. So most people either couldn't understand that or if they had an inkling of understanding, they certainly couldn't believe it at that particular time. And in fact, he said that the Lotus Sutra wouldn't be understood by many people at that time, but that it would be the teaching for the age of Mapo, M-A-P-P-O. Mapo, he said, this age would begin 2,000 years after he died. And then, he said, people would have the intellectual capacity to be able to understand the Lotus Sutra and practice it. And furthermore, he said that another Buddha would appear at that time in order to teach the people. The other important point which the Lotus Sutra taught was that these ten worlds would be could be or would be expressed with absolute consistency from one's entire life. Whatever world or state of life you were in, it would be expressed totally and consistently in every possible way from that life. And we then run in to the theory of Ichinen Sanzen, or the 3,000 worlds in a moment of existence. That is to say, that since Shakyamuni said that Buddha is in everybody, and since people are in all sorts of different worlds in their daily lives, it must have meant that the ten worlds are within each of those ten worlds. This is known as the mutual possession of the ten worlds. That is to say, even the Buddha has hell, hunger, animality, anger, and all the rest of it within him, in his life. And this is a very important principle because it meant that a Buddha is in fact an ordinary human being, but a human being who is enlightened to life. So this was vitally important, especially in those early days because many people looked upon Shakyamuni Buddha almost as superhuman, almost as a god. And this is indeed why so many temples contain statues of Shakyamuni Buddha in various positions to which people devote their prayers. But actually in the Lotus Sutra, a sutra which was so difficult to understand for people in that age, he pointed out that everyone could be Buddha and that Buddha had within it all those other nine worlds. So that is a clear statement that Buddha is a human being, and furthermore a human being in which all the other worlds are capable of working. So likewise, anybody who is in hell, I hope nobody is here tonight, also has Buddha within them. This again is an extremely important point because it means that no matter what your sufferings, no matter what awful things you may have done in the past, you can attain Buddhahood. So Buddhahood is attainable to anybody, whatever their past, whatever their sufferings, and whatever miserable state they might be in at this particular moment. So that is the mutual possession of the ten worlds. Ten by ten worlds equals a hundred. Simple arithmetic. So going on from there, as I said a little earlier, 
The Buddha then expounded what are known as the ten factors. And these concern the way in which we can express any one of these worlds from our life into our environment and also, of course, within the whole of our life itself. The ten factors of life. The ten factors are we recite every day in Gongyo. I don't know how many of you have heard Gongyo being performed, but you may remember at the end of the Hoban chapter, we recite three times over, Nyoze So, Nyoze Sho, Nyoze Tai, Nyoze Riki, and so on. Each one of those is a factor of life. And this, as I say, is how these worlds, or the world that you're in at any particular moment, are expressed from your life. So the ten factors are Nyoze So, the physical aspect of your life. You express whatever world you're in, anger, hell, hunger, or Buddha, through the physical aspect of your life. And Nyoze So through the spiritual or unseen aspect of your life. And Nyoze Tai is the very core or entity of your life itself. So if you're in the state of anger, even the entity of your life is holy in that state. Nyoze Riki is power, the power which expresses that state. Nyoze Sa is the influence that you create around you through being in that state. So again, anger is an easy example. How your anger can have such an effect in any room that you walk into. If you walk in full of smiles, radiating warmth that has a very different effect to walking into a room with a grim face obviously seething with anger of some sort even without opening your mouth people can feel it in the room, can't they? That is Nyoze Sa, the influence of the power of your life wherever you may be and then Nyoze In is the inherent cause that is to say because of your anger, using that example again, you are bound to make causes inherently in your life will, which will then express themselves externally, which is nyoze en. Maybe you speak angrily to someone. Maybe you spit at them. Maybe you hit them. That is the external cause arising from the inherent cause of your anger. And that in its turn has Nyoze Ka, an external effect. You hit someone, maybe they run away. But there is also an inherent effect in that person's life. That's Nyoze Ho. That is to say the person may run away, but as they're running, they may be saying definitely, next time I meet that guy walking down the street, I'm going to really slaughter him. Hmm? That is the inherent effect which lives in his life, that other person's life, until they meet again. And finally, there is Homma Kukyoto. Homma Kukyoto, which is how we end that recitation of Nyoze So, Nyoze Sho, Nyoze Tai, Nyoze Riki. Homma Kukyoto. And that is consistency from beginning to end. That is to say, whatever world or state of life you may be in, you will express it in those ten different ways. And they will be absolutely consistent. So if you are in anger, you really can't hide it because it will radiate from you physically, spiritually, from the entity of your life itself, through the power of your actions and the influence that they create, and through causes and effects, absolutely consistency, consistently from beginning to end. So this was an amazing teaching, an incredible enlightenment as to the mechanics of life. And when he Shakyamuni Buddha taught it, most people couldn't understand it at all. And he understood this. He knew they wouldn't, because actually he was teaching this for the people of Mapo 
2,000 years after he died. So 2,000 years after Shakyamuni died is approximately the year 1,000. Approximately. No one knows exactly the date of Shakyamuni's death and the scholars are still arguing about it to this day but it's roughly round about 900 to 1,000. And that was when Shakyamuni said this age would begin when there was a great deal of unhappiness in the world and a great deal of chaos and misery and disaster, war and so on. This was the age of Mapo in which we've all been born. And the age of Mapo, Shakyamuni said, would continue on for 10,000 years into eternity. But I'm glad to say that he didn't say the whole of the age of Mapo would be unhappy and chaotic. The early part of Mapo, he said, would be. And at that time, the teaching of the Lotus Sutra would require to be practiced if people were to attain happiness. So there's one more step in this amazing theory of Ichin and Sanzen, and that is called the Three Realms. The Three Realms. Now, the three realms are very simple, really. They are the, the realm of your inner self, the realm of yourself, if you like, and the realm which we call society, and the realm which is the land itself, the actual land in which you live. So, those each of those worlds, whichever one is in the ascendancy of your, of your life, will be expressed through the ten factors and into the three realms. So, again going back to the example of anger, that will be expressed, of course, within your own life, realm number one, and will also be felt and create influence and causes and effects in society and also in the land itself. So I don't know whether we've got any farmers here tonight, but I'm sure a farmer would agree that if he's in the state of anger, his wisdom is unlikely to work and he'll make a mess of his land in the process. So in every possible way, the state of life you're in emanates from you and from me in all those different ways. So, of course, one other thing one understands from this amazing theory is how incredibly powerful life is. This is the point that most of us don't appreciate. We have a term in Buddhism called Ichinen, and it arises from this theory. Ichinen means your determination with your whole life, your life's determination, if you like. So, whatever state you're in will be expressed in those 3,000 different ways. But likewise, anything, any determination that arises about, out of those various worlds will obviously be expressed in the same way. So if you're living in the world of hunger, which is a strong desire to possess things, say, then that strong desire will express itself in those 3,000 different ways. If you're living in the world of anger and you wish to dominate others, then it'll be expressed in the same way so strongly. And of course for this reason, uh, the world of anger can create a state of war, for example. But also, most important of all from the point of view of Buddhism, if Buddha is your main state, then Buddhahood will be expressed from your life so powerfully in 3,000 different ways. So this is why, of course, benefit comes through the practice. The purpose of the practice of Buddhism is to elevate your life into the Buddha state. Therefore, the emanations from that Buddha state are radiating out from one in 3,000 different ways into the environment. Therefore, the environment Buddhism 
points out, will begin to work with you because of the influence of the Buddha state emanating from you. And in that way, of course, benefit comes in all sorts of different ways. So this is quite a difficult theory, uh, perhaps, to understand, and I've only explained it very briefly tonight. But as you pursue the Buddhist practice and study Buddhism, so the realism of this theory becomes more and more a living thing to one. And one really begins to see it working in your life. So even now, uh, those of you who are only hearing this for the first time, if on the way home you think about the ten states of life, the ten worlds, the basis for this theory, you will begin to recognize all these worlds in your life. And maybe, if you're anything like me, you'll start to see if Buddhism is really right. Can I think of any other world? I'm sure there must be other worlds beyond just those ten that my life can be in. But I take a bet with you, however hard you think, you won't be able to find one that is outside the ten named there. And a little later on in this lecture, we'll go through each world and explain it in detail. So that is the theory of Ichinen Sanzen. And I've gone into that uh, in a little bit of detail because I think it's important to understand the effect of being in, these, in, in any one of these worlds is tremendous. And as we go through a, each world and study it, probably you can think of times in your life where, you know, your anger or your yearning hunger, or even if you were in hell, have in fact it affected your life far beyond its inner self out into your environment. The title of the Lotus Sutra that Chakamuni taught was called in Chinese characters Myoho Renge Kyo. This was the title of the Lotus Sutra in Chinese characters, actually pronounced with Japanese phonetics. As you know, the Jap Japanese language uses Chinese characters. The pronunciation of those characters in Japanese is Myoho Renge Kyo. So then we come to the vital part which Nichiren Daishonin played. Nichiren Daishonin, who uh, was born in 1222, just after the beginning of that age called Mapo, was the person who taught how to apply to the Lotus Sutra, the Lotus Sutra in our daily lives. In other words, he fulfilled the predictions of Shakyamuni Buddha in being the person who took the Lotus Sutra, dissected it, and found in the heart of it the way to practice it. Shakyamuni Buddha had never taught the way to practice it because it wasn't the age for people to do so. He was teaching 2,000 years before Mapo. But Nichiren Daishonin dissected it and took from its heart the way to practice it. And the way to practice it, he said, was to chant over and over again to one's heart's content, Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. Nam meaning to devote your life to the Myoho Renge Kyo, which is the law of life itself. And furthermore, he uh, devised in his wisdom the object of devotion to which one should concentrate one's mind as one is chanting Nam Myoho Renge Kyo. And this is what we call the Gohonzon. So both Nam Myoho Renge Kyo and the Gohonzon, the key to our practice, and to the attainment of Buddhahood, uh, we'll talk about in separate lectures. Also, Nichiren Daishonin pointed out through explanations taken from the Sutra itself that Buddhahood, or the attainment of it, in the age of Mapo, 
is not a matter of practicing lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. On the contrary, through the Lotus Sutra, it was apparent that Buddhahood could be attained in one single lifetime and that the seed to be sown within you in order to achieve it was nam myoho So, of course, this was revolutionary. When we come to do the history of Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism, you will hear of the persecutions that Nichiren Daishonin underwent as a result of his pronouncement. He was persecuted for nearly his entire lifetime. This, too, Shakyamuni Buddha had predicted in some detail. Because it was totally revolutionary in that day, and it challenged the religious beliefs of everybody in Japan at that time. So I hope that just gives you an inkling of the theory and practice which is behind the incredible teaching called the Ten Worlds. So shall we go on now to look at each world? And as we do so, maybe you could think of your life and the times when you've been in one of those worlds. The first six worlds, hell, hunger, animality, anger, tranquility and rapture, are known as the six lower worlds. And the remaining four, learning, absorption, bodhisattva and buddhahood, are called the four noble or higher worlds. Six lower worlds, four higher worlds. Why are they called that? The answer is that you move higgledy-piggledy through the six lower worlds according to influences from your environment. Almost one might say helplessly. You can move from anger to hell to hunger according to what the environment is, pre is presenting your life with, what you're experiencing. So, for example, you can get a fantastic letter from your girlfriend and you're in rapture and the next minute the telephone rings and you hear you've been given the sack, you're in hell, and then you put on the television or something to console yourself or drink a double scotch and uh, you find yourself feeling a bit warmer perhaps even getting into tranquility for a few moments until someone knocks on the door and drops a bill that you can't afford to pay through it and you're back in hell again and so on. This is how one revolves through these six lower worlds, through the influence of the environment. The four noble or higher worlds are caused that because you have to make great effort to get into them. You have to make effort to get into the four higher worlds. Obviously, to learn something or master a craft or to be creative or to help others, which is bodhisattva, and certainly to attain Buddhahood, you've got to make great effort yourself personally and individually in order to do so. So I hope that's clear the reason why they're called the four higher or noble worlds and the six lower worlds. And within the six lower worlds there lie what are known as the three evil paths. The three evil paths, which are the first three, hell, hunger, and animality. Sometimes they're called the four evil paths and include anger. But whatever happens, those first four are the most difficult worlds that we have to cope with daily in our lives. And of course Buddhism is teaching that every single living thing has these worlds within them. And especially evident in the human being, of course, who is a thinking creature. So let's look at hell first. Buddhism, of course, is saying that hell and heaven, which is the world of rapture, exist nowhere else but in this world. Because in many religions, it was taught that hell was somewhere else. And often it was described as underground. 
in some fearful pit. This is quite a reasonable description which was made in those very early days when such descriptions were given to people. Because actually, when you're in the state of hell, if you've ever been in there, I certainly have, you feel oppressed. You feel really weighed down as if you can't get your head up because the problems you are surrounded with are so great. Even the lights seem darker. Everything is heavy. So this is why, very graphically really, in the olden days, hell was described as underground. It's a state where you're totally oppressed and imprisoned by the circumstances in your environment. It could be death. It could be toothache. It could be the loss of someone you dearly love. Many different reasons. But whatever happens, you feel totally cast down by it. So cast down that you can't see the light. You can't see any way out of the problem. This is the torture of being in hell. So there are many different states of hell. I'm not going to talk about them tonight. But Buddhism classifies each one. There are icy cold hells and very hot hells. There are slimy hells, smelly hells, bloody hells, every sort of hell. There are actually about 15 of them. But they're really true. I haven't got time to give examples of each tonight, but really one can maybe remember being in an icy hell or a hot hell. There are very vivid descriptions of the various types of hell that you can find yourself in depending on the cause for your being there. The hell, because you're battened down and oppressed and you can see no way out, is a world of frustrated anger. An anger which sees and smolders inside. It's not a demonstrative anger. There's no way you can be demonstrative. But it's seething and bubbling and smoldering inside one. So of course there is separately a world of anger. But that is the world of arrogance and domination. This is a different sort of anger. A smoldering resentment and frustration. Fortunately, in the world of hell, there are means of getting out of it. And that Buddhism in its early days, in its very colorful language, described as the hellhounds. The hellhounds, of course, are imaginary creatures who snap and snarl and bite and menace you so much that even though you're oppressed, you, in your fear and hate of the place that you're in and your determination to somehow get out as things seem to get worse and worse and worse and you're cornered more and more you make an immense effort and get yourself out of hell so Buddhism describes those as the hellhounds biting I was going to say at your bottom uh, it doesn't say that but that's what they're doing so fortunately, hell is so miserable and so awful that even though you feel oppressed for a time, in the, in the end your human spirit and your desire to be free causes you to make some colossal effort to get out. And the sooner the better. So believe it or not, there is a positive side to every one of these worlds. And particularly, there is a positive side to the three evil paths. Nothing is without value in life. There is value in hell. And the value is that unless you knew it, you wouldn't know what happiness was. It sounds strange, doesn't it? But it's really true. Those of you who have been in incredible suffering will remember the joy and happiness when you climbed out of it. 
and possibly that joy and happiness has remained a marvelous memory that you can feed on, that can feed your spirit for your lifetime. Without hell, you couldn't know true happiness. So even hell has a purpose. And of course, additionally, the fear of hell is what makes people, in the end, really try hard to live a life that won't lead them into hell again, isn't it? In other words, we make effort to be positive and valuable in our lives because we don't want to go back into hell. And certainly, it's one of the reasons that people practice religions. And religions are very important. Because they elevate one's state of life. So hell in every way is an important thing. Without hell to drive us forward, we would very easily become complacent, idle, and useless. Now let's go on to hunger. Hunger, of course, meaning greed. Hunger is a state where there seems to be within one an inexhaustible desire to possess or to achieve something to satisfy your desires. There are waves of yearning and action to perhaps possess material possessions or for money or for sex or even for sleep for food, for power, or honor, a yearning even to preserve yourself at all costs against all odds, hungering after life in many different ways, hungering after one's desires. This is the world of hunger. And it's a world that can very easily possess one. Because the peculiar thing is that the moment you attain your desire through the driving force of hunger, you find you don't, you're not satisfied and you want something more. This is the world of hunger at work. Yearning always for something. And when you get it, yearning for something else. So hunger, of course, is instinctive. It can have a very bad effect on one's life if it takes power of one. Because one li one's life is then following a narrow, selfish path only for one's own self-satisfaction. But like all the lower worlds, it has a purpose. It has a positive side. And that is, it's a driving force, of course. One's desires are a driving force. So the Buddhism we practice is amazing in that respect because uh, one of its main principles is to turn desires into enlightenment. That is to say, through the Buddhist practice, you chant for your desires. But the process of chanting is so strong that it will then lead you to what you really need for your happiness or what you really need to develop your life. Therefore, Buddhism, in Nichiren Daishonin's teachings, does not in any sense deny one's desires. Many religions have tried and do try to deny desires. It's impossible. Desires are a, a, a part of one's life. If you repress desire, in the end it will bounce back. You can't remove desire. But Buddhism gives a practice which is so powerful and strong that it can turn your desires into enlightenment. In other words, you can chant even for something that might appear to be shallow, but always the power of the practice will lead you another step towards enlightenment because you are actually doing the practice of chanting. 
So quite easily the world of hunger can be turned over a period of time into another world or even towards the world of Buddhahood. So hunger in its positive way also is a driving force for peace or fair play or justice. People can yearn for it, hunger for it. That is hunger working in a positive so perhaps way. I should have mentioned that everyone has a main tendency in their life. This is their karma. The main tendency being the state they move into more often than any other. For some it may be anger. For others, maybe hunger. For others, tranquility. For others, even hell. Some people yearn for hell in a peculiar way. They feel sort of protected in hell even though they don't like it and are always longing to get out of it. Animality. Uh, Nichiren Daishonin described as the world of stupidity. That is to say, it's an instinctive world. An animal world where people act and react without thought or preparation or planning. Instinctively in the moment. So neither reason nor conscience, uh, nor conscience works in the world of animality at all. Impulsive and instinctive actions. And as you know, the nature of animals in the main is to threaten the weak and bow to the strong. And this tendency to bow before someone you feel is superior to you and perhaps to bully even, or dominate someone who you feel is weak to you, is a very, very common tendency in human life, isn't it? This is the world of animality, the instinctive world. In other words, really it's the world of the struggle to survive, the struggle for the species, isn't it? To save the species, species instinctively, animals react in a certain way, and so do human beings. There's a line from Nichiren Daishonin's writings, which I'll just read to you. Fish out of their instinct for survival shun a pond's shallow places and dig holes to hide themselves. Yet, tricked by bait, they take the hook. That's the world of animality. Because they wanted to su survive, their hunger makes them forget everything. Having dug their hole and hidden themselves, they come out and take the hook and get caught. So many things in human life arise from the world of animality. Certainly, uh, from the world of animality and hunger together comes such matters as pollution of the environment and the fight for survival, which can sometimes lead to war. So, the world of animality is a blind world of instinct in which man could quite easily, in the end, destroy himself. But again, this world has its positive side. It's an essential part of life like all the other worlds. The instinctive action to preserve oneself or those one loves, for example, the action without thought is very important. For example, if a baby falls into a fire or a bonfire, the mother without a moment thought will grab it and save it. This is animality at work. That instinctive desire to save that baby's life that arises in the mother's heart. This is the good side of it. The instinctive action, in other words, to preserve the species. Also, of course, from that world has become, has grown many amazing uh, discoveries for the production of food which never existed before. We are aware that food is becoming short. So man in his determination to make sure his species survives is moving into all sorts of different fields and areas in order to find fresh areas of fresh sources 
of food and nutrition. This is partly the instinct of survival. Of course, also it contain, may contain the world of hunger, where man turns from that pure instinct or animal instinct to desiring for profit in the process. Now, to anger. So, anger, as I said a little earlier, is not the world of frustrated, seething, tormenting anger of the world of hell. Anger, the world of anger, is the world of domination. The world in which a person desires to dominate everyone and everything in his environment. In other words, very much the world of the selfish ego. Other people's feelings are ignored for the sake of personal profit or personal power. People in this world can be ruthless in their criticism and in their actions. In the Dialogue on Life, which incidentally is the book in which you can read amazingly interesting descriptions of the various ten worlds. Mr. Ikeda, who whose dialogue is recorded there, said, Anger is the dominance of the selfish ego. It renders people deaf to other people and drives them to a feverish pursuit of personal profit and egocentric goals. This self in the world of anger is thus intensely egoistic. And Tentai the Great, who is known as the Buddha of Zoho, about 1,000 years after Shakyamuni Buddha died, said this about the world of anger. He who is in the world of anger, motivated by the warped desire to win everything, despises others and tries to justify and value himself above all else. He is like a hawk sweeping the, su the sky in search of prey. He may have superficial benevolence, righteousness, propriety, wisdom and sincerity and seem to have some kind of moral sense, but his heart remains in anger. In other words, people in the world of anger are quite often very difficult to discern because outwardly they seem to be moral, correct, and so on. But inwardly their desire is to dominate. So this is also the world of the self-consciousness. Such people are self-conscious. Their own lives they see often rather poorly. They may lack confidence. And therefore they build this barrier around themselves or a high wall, if you like, from which they take pot shots at everyone else around them. Of course this is in their minds. So war arises from this world of anger and arrogance. The positive side of it is passion. Anger when it's positive I think one can call passion. A passion for justice, or for fair play, or for good treatment for old people, or for poor people. A passion to see the world's resources fairly shared amongst the third world countries and so on. This is the positive side of anger, a passion for justice and happiness for others. Tranquility, which is the next one, is, as its name suggests, a very peaceful and calm world. It's actually also called in Buddhism the world of humanity, as well as tranquility. That may sound strange because so few of us as humans ever seem to be in tranquility these days. But it's called that because it's the point of balance in human life between the lower worlds, which are so negative or can be so negative and destructive, and the higher worlds that can be so positive. It's a world which is stagnant, basically, a neutral world in which nothing particular happens. A world, maybe, 
where you relax and don't think of anything particularly and maybe switch on the radio or a tape with your favorite music and you do nothing productive particularly in that time. Nevertheless, it's important to life. Sometimes we must relax and be tranquil. So, of course, the problem is that it's very, very difficult to stay in that world. You want to be tranquil at the end of maybe a hard day's work. And then, blow me down, the telephone goes and Aunt Ethel's on the line pouring all her problems out into your ear. Or whatever. So many ways tranquility can be spoiled. A million different ways. How often do we achieve tranquility, really, in the life we have to live today? Very, very rarely can we sustain it. So the point of view of Buddhism, you need great wisdom to sustain tranquility for so long as it is valuable for you. You have to, in a way, fight for tranquility with your wisdom. And when you've achieved it, only your wisdom in handling your life and controlling your environment will enable you to stay there for so long as it's good for you. So, tranquility has its bad side, its negative side, which is that it is stagnant. The world of tranquility produces nothing of value except rest and peace for yourself, which is certainly valuable. But so far as the world is concerned, it's creating nothing. Therefore, if one is always seeking tranquility, it's probable that one is trying to escape from life. On the other hand, the positive side I've already explained. Some tranquility is necessary for our well-being. And last of all, of the six lower worlds, is rapture. Rapture is the world where you achieve your desires. And as you do so, you feel so thrilled, don't you? You feel heady and light. Your steps are bouncy. You feel full of the joy of life. And because of that, I'm afraid you don't look where you're going. Rapture is a dangerous world. It's beautiful, it's wonderful, but it lasts a short time. It's the world, isn't it, of Johnny head in air. It's the world in which you are so rapturous that you don't notice the manhole cover that's been left open in front of you. And so many things, of course, can pull you straight from rapture into hell. So this concludes the six lower worlds and leaves us now to go on to the four higher worlds. And you remember those are the worlds where we have to make effort. So, the first one is very simple and straightforward. Learning, the world where you make effort to master a particular craft or subject, to gain knowledge, and to elevate your life through learning. So in those very early days of Buddhism that I was telling you about, when they were teaching that each world was separate and that you were sort of categorized in that, they would try through the teachings to elevate someone from a lower world into, say, the world of learning through encouragement, to improve their way of life. This was Shakyamuni Buddha's intention in the earliest days of his and teaching. Then after learning comes absorption. Absorption uh, is also called the world of partial enlightenment. The world of absorption is the world where the human mind totally concentrates on some particular and partial aspect of life. So certainly artists will do this. A great painter, in order to create a great painting, will concentrate his whole life, his whole mind and his whole energy into that particular area of life which he wishes to depict. The world of absorption. But in doing that, in concentrating one's mind, 
definitely enlightenment often comes to a particular aspect of life, to that aspect of life on which the mind is concentrated through this intense effort and thought. So this is why it's also called the world of partial enlightenment. But also it can be a very narrow world. So both learning and absorption have their negative side, which is that it can be so narrow, so blinkered. Many great artists have lived desperately unhappy lives. How much of that was due to the fact that they were absorbed with their art and their creativity and ignored and neglected everything else around them? This is the world of absorption. Also, it can be an arrogant world. It's very easy to move from those two worlds into anger. Because, in a sense, they can both become very egotistical, very self-centered. Nothing should interrupt or argue with or or suggest other or different to a person in the world of absorption. Now this is the negative side of it. Absorbed in the then self. Bodhisattva, the world where you desire above everything else to help others. So of course this world uh, comes naturally in the form of, for example, dedicated nurses, dedicated uh, GPs, doctors, other people doing great work in helping uh, in famine areas and so on. This world of bodhisattva. But the problem with bodhisattva is that it's extremely difficult to sustain. And when one's strength in the state of bodhisattva is beginning to weaken, it becomes also the world of self-sacrifice, the negative side of the world of bodhisattva. In other words, a pure, completely noble intention can in the end become uh, an area for one's ego to get at work in the form of self-sacrifice. I'm doing this great work for others. I am superior to those others, but I'm doing it all for them, for the poor, for those who are debilitated in one way or another. It can wear thin, turn into egoism. This is the terrible danger of bodhisattva in its normal state. But fortunately, the world of Buddha, the highest world of all, reveals itself in action in life in the world of Bodhisattva. So, what Buddhism would say is that you can only sustain Bodhisattva actions through a lifetime or over a long period through activating your Buddha state. Then the actions of, in the Bodhisattva state will be pure and entirely noble in quality. And self-sacrifice will never enter into it. So therefore Buddhism says, if you are to live in the world of Bodhisattva and take actions as a Bodhisattva, you must attain the ascendancy of the Buddha state in your life in order to do so. So finally Buddha, the highest state of all, is of course extremely difficult to describe. I've already given you one aspect of its qualities which is in the world of Bodhisattva. But basically Buddhahood I believe is a state of life where because one is enlightened to everything about life, to the, to the workings of the law of cause and effect, to the mechanics of life, which are not just theories, but living things which one totally understands. 
because there are no corners that are dark in life therefore there's no fear we fear always the unknown don't we therefore if one becomes enlightened to life there are no areas of unknown and fear leaves us so this is one of the great freedoms of the Buddha or the Buddha state that there is no fear and secondly there are no limitations because you understand how life works you challenge things that otherwise would never be challenged because everyone says it is impossible would not be necessarily impossible to the Buddha because the Buddha understands the workings of life and knows in fact that there are no limitations to what man can achieve except his own imagination provided you use the power of life itself in order to do so Buddha is the state of life where you use all these other worlds positively to their total value now this is the important point which we've been coming to all the way through this talk that each of the worlds has a positive side and that positive side is essential and so for that matter is the negative side as a driving force but in the world of Buddha even though the world of anger may be working in your life and you remember that each world has the other nine within it that anger will turn 180 degrees and appear in a positive form so everything in life is working positively in the Buddha state everything other world that passes through it is turned from negative to positive so Buddha is a state of absolute freedom freedom from fear freedom from limitations of any sort through total enlightenment as to the meaning and workings of life and the great benefits that can be attained from it. So I hope through this lecture you now have some idea of the purpose of the Buddhist practice. There is only one purpose and that is to make the main tendency of life Buddha rather than say anger or hunger or animality or absorption even this is the purpose of the practice so Buddha is not a superhuman or a god but a human being revealing his or her absolute full potential using his or her life to its absolutely fullest in every direction in order to create value and happiness in both him or herself and in the environment I've talked for a rather long time but I hope it hasn't confused you too much the thanks very much is, for listening what part did Tientai play in forming the theory of the ten worlds right so you remember I mentioned that Tientai was also known as the Buddha of Zoho Zoho was the period that began 1000 years after Shakyamuni Buddha died it was he who named it Zoho so the first thousand years after he died he said would be called Shoho and he predicted that during that period his earlier teachings would still have full effect and give happiness to the people And in the second thousand years he said which he called Zoho he said that people would formalize his teachings and ritualize them and build statues to himself although he said worship the law and not me and it was during that period of Zoho however that some great thinkers were produced or appeared who in fact were the founders of Mahayana Buddhism and one of these was Tiantai the Great who lived in China and it was he who actually spelt out as a system this theory called Ichin and Sansin. in other words he took the Lotus Sutra and found this theory clearly stated within it and then 
he systematized it or explained it in a way which was understandable to human beings in general. So Gentile was very important. Sometimes it's said that Shakyamuni Buddha uh, made the blueprint of enlightenment, the house of enlightenment, if you like. And Tiantai then built the scaffolding, which was the theory of Ichin and Sanzen. And Nichiren Daishonin then built the house in which we can live and practice and become the Buddha ourselves. So he was very important, Terry. Does that answer your question? Okay.